Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us uh, in this session. Uh, I've lived in uh, Tokyo now for uh, what is uh, more than 35 years. So I think it's an absolutely wonderful city, one of the best cities in the world. Um, and we have a distinguished a guest, a panel of uh, distinguished uh, guests here today to uh, talk a little bit about the future of Tokyo, Tokyo in 2020 and onwards. Um, it's normal in these sort of discussions for me to ask a question and ask each panelist to, uh, to make a comment to, uh, to kick us off. But I'm going to do this a little bit differently because this is all about Tokyo. It's a city where we all live or visit. So I'd first of all just like to throw a question to you, the audience, <laughs> and get three or four people to just tell us, what do you love about Tokyo? What's great about Tokyo? And where do you think Tokyo needs to try a little bit harder? Where do you think Tokyo lacks in compared? And that can be from your own perspective, from comparison with another city. And then we'd like to take that as panelists to comment on how you feel about Tokyo. So would anyone like to, uh, to uh, kick us off? Hi. OK, I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> OK, one word why I'm here is access. And then I don't quite get the, uh, my moment at Okara and the Save the Okara <laughs> campaign, how that really didn't go anywhere. Uh, I would love to see Tokyo really embrace the past and bring it forward in, uh, in its design, and I think there are a lot of architects doing that. And I think one of the issues for Tokyo, I, I'm living in a postage stamp apartment in the center of the center of Tokyo, but a lot of people live outside Tokyo, so a sense of ownership and kinship with Tokyo often comes from people who come here and are from other countries, and we just embrace it, and we give up a lot of real estate for the access of the people and ideas. Thank you. Anyone else? Next person. Yes. Nick. I don't get. I don't come here that often, and uh, I don't speak uh, Japanese. But I frequently I travel an enormous amount. It's one of the few cities where I never feel I totally understand my bearings of where things are. Not because things are only in Japanese, but I find it actually quite difficult to relate one place to another and to find out where I'm going, whether it be above ground or below ground, which is one of the reasons I don't think I come here very often. Interesting, interesting. Um, yes. <coughs> Thank you. One of the things I used to hate about Japan, but now that I, um, I love about it is that uh, it never used to change. Things used to stay always the same, and it's the same people running things. And now there are changes everywhere. You can see change throughout society and throughout architecture and art and all sorts of things. And I think that, that's what makes living in this city uh, so much fun and, and encouraging and, um, and really motivating. Okay, um, we've had uh, three uh, gaijin comments. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing as we're talking about Tokyo, it would be nice to have some Nihonjin comments. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. I was born in Tokyo. I'm a sushi chef oh, there. Wow. Yeah, and I can cook any kind of sushi there. Uh, Tsukiji is the number one biggest uh, fish market. It's a very proud of me. I used to... Uh, to go to the Tsukiji uh, 30 years ago. Then I very proud of the Tsukiji. Thank you. Great. Mm. Uh, yes, I guess Tsukiji is part of Tokyo's um, heart, part of Tokyo's culture, and part of Tokyo's art, in a sense. In a sense. One more Japanese person, yes. as a second representative of Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I, you. I think uh, the Tokyo is a source of, I source of innovation in terms of new combination of several technologies and se several companies in some areas, I think. Um, I personally in the mobile, so mobile service provider, so mobile is one source of innovation. Uh, the second thing, I think, uh, th second thing I think is that Tokyo allows diversity. Uh, people can walk in weird dress, <laughs> so. I think that the two second thing are uh, two things. 
Thank you very much. So we've had uh, comments about um, access, embracing the past and bringing it forward. Um, Nick made the point about never really understanding where you are in Tokyo. It's a difficult city to perhaps get that relate to. Um, Tim mentioned changes going on everywhere. We had uh, our sushi chef uh, tell us the wonderful things about Squidgy and then the source of innovation and diversity and I guess diversity in a city that is a culture that's not that diverse intrinsically. Um, Inokuma-san, perhaps uh, as uh, someone from the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, what areas is the government focusing on in terms of Tokyo and where it needs to, uh, to perhaps uh, uh, improve or try harder? Um, the in a broader sense, the broader point, uh, we want to make Tokyo um, most livable city. Uh, the monocle uh, said that uh, we are livable city, but uh, we would like we would like to improve more and sustainable the clean air and drinkable water, and uh, also the leading global city. And uh, in order to become the leading uh, global city, we really understand that we have to uh, improve our accessibility that we should open Tokyo more to the world. So uh, we, uh, the, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, the Government of Japan, and the, the private companies, the 60 of them, uh, established a consortium to a multilingual like a strategy. So they uh, exchange the information and uh, they are running the, the good uh, best practices of the multilingual things. Thank you. Um, Adrian is a visitor um, to Tokyo um, and a visitor to many, many cities around the world. Um, how do you feel about Nick's comment w about the, the, I guess, the accessibility? Uh, I think people who live in Tokyo think it's a very accessible city yeah. and it's easy to get around. Um, <coughs> I think I'd wholeheartedly agree with Nick, actually, uh, which uh, I will take him by surprise. I'm sure he'll fall off his chair gently. Um, I love Tokyo. I think it's a fantastic city. But personally, as a non-Japanese speaker, I do find it incredibly difficult to find my way around it and to navigate it. I don't, it doesn't have recognizable districts in the sense of a Broadway, in the sense of a Museum Mile, or a West End, or a Soho. It's, uh, I you have to find Tokyo. It won't find you. And I think that's a very difficult thing when it comes to culture, because very often people want to bump into culture, especially as tourists, as newcomers. And I think you have to go and seek it out. And for example, last weekend, I happened to be in Tokyo on a stopover, and I went to the Nezu Museum, and there was no guide in English. It was only a Japanese guide. Now, I'm not suggesting everyone should, uh, should bow down before English, but certainly multilingual um, processing of, of exhibits and, and access to exhibits is an important part of opening up some of those cultural treasures that you have here in Tokyo. Um, and I do think, you know, going back to your point, um, ma'am, about uh, accessibility, I think one of the key things about the opportunity Tokyo 2020 presents is opening up Tokyo to the world um, rather than selling Japan to the rest of the world. I think it's really crucial because there's so much energy and dynamism in, uh, in Japanese culture, but I think it can only really succeed going forward if it opens itself up to newcomers, incomers, and other cultures, because I think fusion is what drives cultural creativity, and fusion is what uh, is the potential that I think we see here in, uh, in Tokyo. Thank you. Um, Tuck, the work you're doing um, with Next 2020, um, perhaps you might be able to make a little bit of comment on some of the um, initiatives that are being taken um, to address some of the issues that, that, that were raised here. Sure, thank you. Yeah, we launched a team called uh, Next Tokyo last year, and the team has um, 10 leading experts from various fields like urban planning, design and art, uh, business and media. And um, the vision has uh, three pillars. Uh, the, first the first one is a fitness city. The second one is a creative city, uh, the center, center theme here. And the third theme is actually information city. And uh, the information city has uh, several initiatives, including uh, the one uh, to develop a user-friendly application for everybody from the world. And that application will be uh, push uh, installed to, to your smartphone when you arrive at uh, major airports. 
uh, that application has uh, multiple functions, including city navigation, uh, restaurant search, hotel search, and uh, disaster prevention, something like that. Um, we are making uh, various proposals to the government of Tokyo and uh, the national government as well. Uh, we still have to find a um, business partner to make it happen. But um, we are hoping that it's going to happen um, between now and 2020. Is the, the vision, for instance, that that app might also um, include some of the, the, the for instance, um, English or multi-language guidance to art museums and things like that, that it would be down to that level to help um, tourists understand Tokyo better? Yes. Um, the information city concepts also include uh, various um, applications of uh, augmented reality and uh, museums are the best place uh, to implement uh, many applications like that. Also, uh, we may want to see uh, AR-aided applications uh, usage on streets uh, because uh, if you go to certain places like Asakusa and uh, you, you see your um, smartphone uh, displays and uh, you, click, you click it, then you see a lot of uh, descriptions about uh, the history and must-see items uh, in that location. Um, several cities actually have done it uh, in Japan, but not, not uh, here in Tokyo yet. So uh, we need to be doing something like that too. G given the size of Tokyo, that's a rather uh, ambitious and immense project, I would imagine. Yeah, that's why uh, we are making a proposal to the governments, uh, both <laughs> at, the, at the national level and on uh, the city level. Okay. Um, many years ago, when I was in my 20s, uh, my wife and I thought we might immigrate to Singapore. And so we went to live in Singapore for two weeks <coughs> and decided that after two weeks, it was one of the coldest, heartless cities in the world. <coughs> Sorry to Singaporeans, but <laughs> and that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. Um, recently, I went to Singapore and went and visited the Bugis area, which has now been turned into this absolutely amazing centre for art and culture. Um, and I was thinking, Tokyo really doesn't have that sort of area. Um, and in our discussion before, we, talk we were talking about the fact that maybe it has many of those areas. Um, Koji, would you like to sort of talk about art in Tokyo and, and, and... Oh, absolutely. And I think this also goes to uh, Sato-san's question about, you know, <coughs> Tsukiji and, you know, the, the food here is delicious, the, the art, the architecture, all the ingredients are there, as the chef I'm sure you can appreciate. You know, it just needs that leadership. And in Singapore, it's a little different because uh, in many ways it runs like a company. Uh, you know, the cultural efforts that have been going on there are much more about a PR campaign to the outside world. Uh, you know, in Japan, I feel that all these sorts of artistic movements are very indigenous uh, and self self perpetuating. However, there hasn't been the right network to bring them all together. Uh, there have been historically very successful governmental programs, say like in like you know Electric Town, like Akihabara or something like this. Uh, you know, but you know, we have to use the communication technology that Tak was just talking about to bring a city of 35 million people uh, together and to translate it in front of their eyes so that they can actually navigate it in a way that's accessible. Um, you know, it's it's interesting to see in Singapore that despite all its efforts from a government perspective, you know, the, the Singapore Art Museum has kind of gone in different directions. Art stage isn't the art fair that really is the center of the art world in Asia. Uh, Hong Kong very much still is the center of the art market. Uh, but in terms of artistic production, uh, the Japanese still are very much at the forefront of that creativity. It's just that it hasn't been able to have a galvanizing force uh, to the contemporary in particular. I think it's very, very strong uh, in the classical arts, uh, you know, whether it's Kyoto or the, you know, the, the, the different temples or, you know, the food. Uh, a lot of, th especially in the, in the government system, you know, you have a very, very strong representation for the classical, uh, you know, and you have a lot of great funding from Japanese corporations. And a lot of the board members tend to be uh, art historians, very, very, you know, well-respected individuals uh, from you know, very, very uh, good universities here. But differing from other landscapes that I see in, in London or, in, or in, uh, in New York, I don't really see as much the private collector 
or uh, you know the uh, the individual leadership uh, on those boards, and you know driving a message that you know uh, promoting contemporary or a reflection of our contemporary culture here in Tokyo uh, is 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 at the forefront. So it's not necessarily about a market; it's just really about a distribution system. You, you said that Hong Kong is the center of the art market for. Asia. Very much. Um, that should be a role that Tokyo should play, it given is, the presence. It is a great mystery, yeah. uh, you know, why, with all the ingredients that Japan has had historically, why would it go to Hong Kong? Um, but, you know, Hong Kong translates easier. It's much easier to navigate, has a history in, in, in British culture, um, and it's very transactional. I think that question comes back to the statement you made, the openness of Tokyo mm. for the rest of the world. If uh, we have um, more and more um, high-level business people and uh, wealthy consumers here mm. are from other nations, then probably Tokyo will have um, one of the world leading art markets and markets for every, everything. But um, because um, the Tokyo and Japan has been uh, closed um, in terms of uh, people uh, for, for many years, probably that's, that's why. And um, I'm sitting on the government panel to promote uh, Cool Japan uh, for, for the past five years. The priority number one theme is really opening up Japan for the rest of the world in terms of um, mixing uh, various cultures and uh, encourage innovation on the cultural side. So, Yeah, I thought um, Adrian's comment, I, the Olympics are not about, uh, are more about opening up Tokyo to the world than selling Japan to the world. Um, and I thought that was a really insightful comment. And I'd like to go back to the audience now and just s ask people, how do they feel about that comment? Is it something that you agree with, that it should be more about opening up Tokyo rather than selling Tokyo or selling Japan. Does anyone have a comment um, on that? The lady who's just... <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to make a comment? <laughs> no? <laughs> <laughs> Open up. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say quickly that um, for many people, I always tweet and post things on Facebook about living here in Tokyo. For a lot of people outside of Japan, Tokyo is Japan to them. I mean, Tokyo really is the gateway to Japan, and I think he was absolutely right on. Tokyo's future city. The rest of Japan is for the person maybe who loves uh, traditional Japanese culture, but Tokyo is about sort of becoming something different. In a way, it's like California is to the rest of the United States. You go out to California to recreate yourself. So you've got to start small, even though Tokyo is big. You can't brand the whole country. You've got to begin with the place. Maybe in the back there. Yes, you. <laughs> Would you like to? <laughs> no? No? Anyone over here like to make a comment? Okay. Again? Yes. I mean, I'd like to lay a challenge here, um, which is that in the, in the next five years, that is what's going to make or break the perceptions of Tokyo, and everything's got to be delivered on this, because that's the way people feel friendly now. If they can get it here, they'll do it. If they can't, they won't bother. And picking up Adrian's point, if you go to that museum, you should be ju uh, just be able to download the app while you're arriving, so you can read in English what's going to happen. And you've got five years to get the software together, and also roaming charges as well. It's those kind of pragmatic things. I mean, to, for me to be here on roaming charges, it's very expensive. Now, I'm uh, happy to do it, but a lot of people won't be able to do it. And, but you can download a lot of megabytage very, or gigabytage very quickly. So it's these kind of things, which I think you're going to have to work through with the telcos and with the software designers. You can have any great concepts in the city hall and among big business and so on, but ultimately it's going to be the friendliness of using that to resolve the questions. Okay. Yeah, I, I know that the city is uh, working on a project to, to make a free Wi-Fi available across the city, so you'll have it in a few years. Inokuma-san, would you like to uh, perhaps add to, uh, to Nick's comment that uh, 
it's all about uh, how effectively we can use the technology, smartphones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, as uh, Umezawa-san said, that the we are determined to uh, the sp uh, expand the spot, the free Wi-Fi will, will be available. Yeah, that is one thing. And also, uh, we try to like uh, set the digital signage so the people can easily um, check the where they are and uh, where they are going to uh, 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 want, want to go. So those kinds of uh, and, uh, and also the in uh, smartphone there is a interpreter system mm -hmm. installed. So we hope that the uh, not only in English but also th in many a number of the language the people can communicate in Tokyo. That's great. Um, another personal experience. I used to travel by train um, and subway to work in Tokyo. Um, and although I'd lived in Tokyo for a long time, it surprised me when I started driving that I really hadn't realized how close Shibuya was to Shinjuku. <laughs> or, or, or how, in fact, compact Tokyo was. And um, in a sense, when you're driving and you have your car navi there, it makes it a lot easier to understand how Tokyo is connected and everything like that. So even from my own personal experience, at a earlier sort of period in time, um, the, uh, the usefulness of technology in actually helping you to navigate Tokyo and the complexity of Tokyo uh, is something that I think is, is really good. I, I'd like to come back um, to uh, Koji's comment about contemporary art mm -hmm. and perhaps that we have a very strong classical art culture and participation here, but not so much on contemporary. Inokuma-san, you mentioned the Tokyo government was doing something with mothers and kids um, to help um, them understand contemporary art more. Uh, the before going to the contemporary art, the Japanese traditional art, the, the children had, have, haven't been taught the traditional art uh, sufficiently in elementary school. And the Tokyo Metropolitan Government uh, uh, established a new project to uh, teach the children the what the traditional arts are. And uh, in terms of the contemporary art, I am a little bit disappointed yesterday that uh, uh, the coach san didn't know the Museum of Comp Contemporary Art of Tokyo, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is located in Kiba. And uh, it has a good reputation uh, in Japan, but um, I think uh, we should um, appear more. Uh, and uh, in that contemporary uh, muse uh, art museum, uh, this summer uh, we planned the like an event uh, in uh, within the museum that we invited <coughs> the babies and the mother together. So usually, mother who uh, ha who should take care of the baby cannot go to the museum, but uh, they are invited and they can touch the contemporary art itself, and so. Uh, let uh, make the children more familiar with the comp contemporary art. Um, your um, comment about uh, Koji not knowing the Tokyo um, Contemporary Art Museum, um, that relates back to Adrian's earlier comment, which was, you have to find Tokyo, <laughs> it won't find you. <laughs> um, and so certainly that's a great example of how, um, you know, you have to go and find Tokyo. Mm -hmm. It's not that Tokyo comes and finds you. Um, we often talk about creativity um, as being um, a product of di diversity. Um, and we had a comment before about how I in Tokyo, in a sense, it's a very wonderful city in that anything goes. I have a friend who's an architect in Chicago, and he loves coming to Tokyo because if you design a building in Chicago, there's all these rules and it has to fit in with the lakes and it has to fit in with the round. And, and yet he said in Tokyo, anything goes. Mm -hmm. You can have the, the Mode Gakuen building beside <laughs> you know, something else building. And, um, and it has many different areas uh, around the place. And I think those multiple hearts of Tokyo are something that um, are very, a very big part of Tokyo. Um, Tak, maybe you can talk a little bit about what are we going to do? I mean, they're all there, but it's hard to find them. Um, what's the plan um, are you proposing to uh, make those areas more more findable and more, um, I guess, vibrant? 
the only thing we are making a serious proposal about that part is um, well number one you know by by the use of uh, those applications we we talked about um, it to ma make um, find in Tokyo uh, so much um, easier and, and the second proposal is um, encouraging individual towns to become um, even more distinctive and unique. So for example, uh, Harajuku for fashion, especially street fashion, Ropongi for art, and um, maybe Ryogoku and Asakusa for traditional culture, um, maybe Tsukiji for food, something like that. And um, by making each one of those individual towns uh, more distinctive and associated with a single theme. Um, probably the Tokyo as a whole will become even more attractive for everybody. Adrian, in your travels, I mean, around the world, cities like New York, Paris, London, um, what makes them so distinct in sort of, I mean, New York, uh, art, for instance, seems to be so easy to find. I think one of the things that's worth thinking about when you uh, look at Tokyo 2020, and one of the things to bear in mind is, is visitor numbers actually go down often during Olympic events. So it's great putting in place sort of short-term uh, measures to improve accessibility for visitors. But actually, for example, in London in 2012, there was a 5% drop in the number of people coming to London, purely because people assumed that the place would be overrun by people visiting sports locations and sports activities. So if you think about the two kind of tracks, on the one hand there's the track of actually improving basic accessibility for short-term visitors. Um, and so they can access some of the cultural attractions that are going to be part of the, of the Olympiad, the cultural Olympiad. But I think more than that, there's an opportunity to look at some of the longer-term structural issues that underlie a lot of what Tak and Koji have been talking about. And I think you, the, uh, the Tokyo government uh, are probably thinking about, which is, what makes these cities so global metropoli, if you like. And I think one of the factors under underneath that is their huge attraction as destinations for education, particularly higher education. I think higher education is becoming one of these uh, mass enablers of globalization. That's the experience. When you go to New York as a young student, when you go to London as a young student, you feel like you're plugging into a part of a global culture even though they're actually very small dots on the, on, the, on the globe. And I think being able to access that in Tokyo is a key part of putting Tokyo onto that global mind map of the millennial generation and the rising generation. How do people plug in to get scholarships to come here to learn, to experience Japan? How do people see themselves in future parts of their careers living and working in Japan? These are all the questions that you need an opportunity like 2020 to be putting into the minds of young people and young professionals because these are the artists, the cultural creators and the folks who are going to do the things that you're talking about now which is turn Tokyo and, and give Japan that next twist that's going to take it into uh, the global kind of super league in terms of art and culture. Um, when we talk about diversity I think and, and, and we talk about Tokyo in the future I guess we um, need to think about how Tokyo can more effectively attract, um, I guess, expat businessmen, their families, um, artists, academics, and those sort of people. Um, and um, just coming back to Adrian's point, one of the big issues with a lot of people that I know is education. They look at education, not only higher education, as Adrian's pointed out, but education for expat children is quite an issue. Um, you know, Kumasa, maybe, do, what's the Tokyo government doing in, in, in the area of sort of education? It's, um, the first, uh, in order to attract uh, experts, uh, we think that the uh, livability is an uh, integral part of for the business. So we uh, increase the number of service apartment and the medical institutions and also international schools by like uh, creating the, the floor for the international school. And also, um, it's uh, like uh, interna inter uh, the that is uh, right, might be the a little bit different thing, but uh, we, Tokyo Metropolitan Government, uh, designate the 10 uh, t me metropolitan high schools as a global 10. The, and the 
10 scores, uh, within those 10 scores, uh, the student receives uh, the education in English, uh, partly, and uh, enc uh, are encouraged to study abroad. And also the interaction uh, between the, the Japanese student and uh, the student, uh, f foreign students are encouraged. However, probably the, you mean that the higher education, right? And um, we don't bring, bringing people in. Mm. Well, so you, you also have Arts Council Tokyo, uh, yes. you know, which is a fantastic program for mm -hmm. bringing, uh, bringing foreigners, foreigners in, uh, yeah, foreign artists to in study and do residencies. Yes, yes, artists in residence. Mm. Sure. Again, th the Cool Japan team is working on two projects related to this. One is uh, to establish um, the world leading graduate level school focused on culinary culture, food. And the second one is about design. And uh, we are talking to a um, few candidates uh, from other countries uh, to, to bring uh, their program and campus to Tokyo to establish uh, the world leading lab and research institute on those two fronts. And that's how uh, we can bring in a lot of high caliber talent uh, from other countries um, on, on those two um, dimensions. Um, in, a, in a world of very easily, easy global mobility, um, I guess cities are in competition with each other um, in many ways um, and uh, I'd just like to ask the panelists, um, where do you think Tokyo shines in comparison to, let's, keep, let's say, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, and maybe Bangkok, just as a little bit, and where does it sort of fall down and what can it address? Koji, would you like to? Sure. I mean, I very much believe that Japan <coughs> is a cultural magnet for, you know, for, for cuisine, for architecture, for design, for contemporary art. Uh, you know, and as we were discussing before, the issue is the distribution. And I th I've always picked up on a theme here of education, but really taking that cultural magnet and turning it into a, a megaphone, a speaker, you know, to be able to communicate to the outside world that it's already here. Um, you know, it, it, it's curious to see, you know, what worked about, you know, Art Expo uh, Osaka in 1960, you know, and, you know, that, that was for foreigners, that's a huge landmark moment of the artistic movements that are only being recognized today. I think there was a bit of a rejection from the Japanese community for Gutai artists, uh, you know, in the last couple of years, but, you know, the international market has picked up very much, uh, very much led by certain institutions in the Guggenheim or galleries like Hauser and Wirth. Uh, but now, uh, you know, especially as I went through the permanent collection of uh, MOT, you know, you, you uh, the Contemporary Art uh, Museum of Tokyo, you know, a lot of those artists are only being recognized now as the majority of the work is Japanese artists working from the 60s and 70s. And then, you know, it's been bolstered by uh, a lot of, you know, mainline like headliners like a Roy Lichtenstein or something like this. But, you know, uh, building off of what's already here, I think, is what uh, can really differentiate it because it's been here for a long time where Singapore has not had that. You know, Hong Kong has certainly not had that. Uh, you know, there is a contemporary history. It just hasn't been recognized. Uh, it, it, it was lost to the canon, uh, you know, that was running parallel, very much like the Zero Group was in Europe. So the competitive, winning the competitive edge is really taking the ingredients, That's the exactly magnet, right. and turning it into a megaphone, That's as you That's right. It's, it, you need the right, le the leadership, the, the, the cook, the ingredients are all there. It just needs that. Um, you know, it could be an individual, it could be a company, it could be, uh, it could be the government, but, you know, leadership matters. Tuck. Well, nothing really to add in terms of uh, where we are strong and where we, we are weak. Uh, another key issue uh, we need to address is actually connecting the dots between the creative side of the society and the business. And if 
Japanese business has um, or takes full advantage of the creativity on the street, uh, probably we can we can develop uh, at least several uh, world leaders in many sectors. Mm -hmm. A company like Apple, it's it's fully possible. But the disconnection between the creative side and the business side is a big uh, lost opportunity. What, why do you think that disconnect exists? Um, most of the Japanese manufacturers are led by um, ex-engineers, mm -hmm. and uh, Japanese engineers are not um, closely um, or not very familiar with the design side, mm -hmm. um, whether it be uh, automotive or consumer electronics. So uh, we are uh, making another proposal to um, make the engineering and design much closer in corporations so that uh, we can have um, much more user-friendly products and services or um, just uh, appealing products and services uh, by those players. There was an article in, uh, I think recently it was the Harvard Business Review about Pepsi's CEO, Indra Nui, and how she <coughs> decided that design had to be much more intrinsic in everything that Pepsi did. And I remember um, the story that she gave all her senior executives a camera and said, go out, take pictures of what you think is good design, put it in an album and bring it back. And she said, the majority of them didn't do it because they didn't know how. <laughs> they, they couldn't d d define what good design was. Um, and yet she's managed to take design and take it from just changing a color on a piece of packaging to actually having a more intrinsic role in the way Pepsi does its business. Um, yeah, I mean, this country has produced uh, so many great or well, greatest architects and <coughs> product designers as well. But um, the companies yeah. have not taken full advantage of that. That's, that's the problem. I, mean, I think when people think of <coughs> Tokyo, you know, they think of Tokyo as a cool city, but probably cool in the sense of frosty and slightly off-putting. And there's that danger that, you know, are you cool enough to come to Tokyo? Are you cool enough to deal with the, with the culture? And I think if you look at Tokyo in comparison with the other cities you mentioned, I mean, Shanghai, um, you know, has good days and bad days, but days when you can barely breathe or see the sky. Um, but it's a city that's going up in front of you. You visit it, there's a sense of palpable energy about it. Um, you know, when uh, we just finished um, a big meeting in China and there was an opportunity for a couple of colleagues to take some time out and visit other cities in this part of the world, Shanghai was a huge destination for those folks. And I said I was coming on to Tokyo, people shrugged slightly and couldn't understand why I wasn't going to see this amazing metropolis that's rising in front of your eyes. And I think, you know, you have to be realistic about what the competition is and the energy and excitement of seeing a growing urbanizing um, environment like Shanghai, you know, the, the tension and the edge that you have in Hong Kong as it struggles to find an identity vis-a-vis -vis the, the government in Beijing, for example, they give a real edge to life. And I think that's something, in a sense, that people miss in Tokyo. If you look at the news stories on Tokyo, the one I read most recently was about people struggling with abandoned homes. You know, this is a story of, of potentially of a society that's grappling with the problems of age that we might all grapple with, but the problems of maybe decline. And I think, if I'm honest, you have to deal with those things in the open and say, how do we arrest that? How do we change that narrative? How do we change that story? And art and culture are fantastic tools for doing that, but they need help. And I don't think you can rely on the indigenous um, initiative as being a response to how Japan deals with that. I think, you know, it's great that you have these uh, strong cultural traditions, but you need help to bring them out. And that means bringing people in and making Tokyo um, a place that people want to come work in, do cultural and creative activities in. I think all the ideas we've heard of up to, up to now are, are excellent and very positive attempts to do that. But I do think it's a huge societal challenge and it really needs as much effort on that creative infrastructure, if you like, as it does on the buildings and the transport. Um, can I just uh, take that comment and w w 
with your earlier comment about opening up Tokyo to the world, do you think there is a need for um, the Tokyo government to be educating the Tokyoites to be more open, to be looking at different ways of, um, of accepting, I guess, um, stuff coming in from overseas. Is that, some, is, that, is that what you're alluding to? Is there a role for that? <coughs> well, I mean, I think, um, you know, Japanese society is uh, facing a number of issues um, that it's really the canary in the coal mine for, for post-industrialism. And I think, you know, how it responds is going to be uh, an example to all of us. But I think, too, it's, it is part of that response is going to have to be, um, you know, playing its part in the global system. You know, London now as a city has something like 40% of an indigenous, indigenous population. If you want to call any of us indigenous, we're Anglo-Saxons. You know, we're economic migrants from the fourth century. Um, so we're not, uh, we're not particularly indigenous. Um, but, you know, that changes the character of a city. It changes what it means to be who you are in that place. And you either have to live with that change and accept it and embrace it, or you can struggle against it and decide that you don't want to play a part in that. And I think the direction that Tokyo goes will, de will determine the direction Japan goes. And if Tokyo can embrace that and be part of that, then I think it's an encouraging sign for Japan, both as a society, but also putting on my World Economic Forum hat as an economy. Because I think for, for Japan to remain strong and resilient, it's going to need to play a full part in the world. And playing a full part in the world means allowing the world to come in and play a full part in your own society. You know, Kumasan, um, Adrian has asked, has sort of said that he sees a need for Tokyo to be more open mm -hmm. to the world. Um, and perhaps that means in sort of attracting people, um, having regular Tokyoites understand that there needs to be more diversity or cultural diversity within Tokyo itself. Um, what sort of initiatives is the government undertaking and how is the government looking at that particular issue of opening up Tokyo? Um, as I first said, that uh, the we uh, well recognized, uh, we all um, recognize that the importance of opening the Tokyo to the world. And uh, however, the it doesn't mean that we will invite any kinds of people. Uh, we w would like to invite the like uh, like a profi proficient people. And the uh, Tokyo government uh, first tried to. Uh, we are inviting or attracting the foreign businesses by establishing the uh, the 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 center where the the startups can uh, finish their uh, procedures of administrative procedures in one place, and also uh, we uh, encourage the the. B the business people to build the high quality buildings to to, uh, to suitable for the, the businesses and also um yeah the about the, the a little bit different thing but uh, the the and, and Dorian mentioned the abundant home mm. and i think the, the it's a problem but uh, it's also a chance uh, recently, the because of the deficit, uh, uh, the, mm, the lack of the, the space of the hotel, the all the business buildings are retro retrofitting to the, the like, uh, business hotels, and also we think we can uh, use those uh, the, the the abandoned ho house or buildings into the like uh, artist residence place. Mm. So um, we try to attract more people and also we would like to uh, ac accommodate the, 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 the demographic uh, change in Tokyo. That's great. Uh, we only have a few more minutes before we have question time, so please, everyone, think of your questions. <laughs> um, Tuck, the, the question of sort of opening up Tokyo, um, more influx of influences from overseas, mm -hmm. um, how do you view that? I fully agree that um, we need to do, we need to take more radical actions on that. Um, and uh, again, we've made a proposal to the government, um, both to the governments, uh, about um, immigration, more proactive immigration of uh, creative professionals, including designers, architects, 
um, chefs and uh, animation and game designers and um, hair and nail artists. Uh, there are many weird um, working visa systems around those professions, but um, not only about not only attracting uh, the high caliber talents uh, in large corporations, but also in those creative industries. Mm. Uh, that's going to help us uh, to make Tokyo a much more uh, interesting place mm. and also uh, help the Japanese creative industries go overseas. Mm. And that's uh, the most important purpose of the Cool Japan uh, strategy as well. Mm. So all the dots are connected, connected. in that direction. That's great. Hair and nail artists. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> Koji. <laughs> I was just thinking one of the things that's really opened up Japan to the rest of the world historically has been its position on the environment, you know, and these sorts of causes that become universal languages for, uh, you know, foreigners to be attracted and to fall in love with Japan. And, you know, I can tell you that it's a very hard place, you know. Because of how small, you know, you know, the locations are for for visual artists to be working, they don't have studio space, and they don't have an alternative to move to because, you know, there isn't the magnetic rail that connects everything to Osaka or anything quite yet. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I I really do feel that you know the openness is uh, kind of is has to come from the people. You know, the, the really supporting them, uh, being passionate and proud. Uh, you know, not only in their legacy. Of the hist of the art from the '60s and from 1600 and beyond, but what our cultural or, or our contemporary community today represents, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, if if you know, sure, you need these universal translators, uh, but you know, I think that they're there in other soft measures, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, just the the aesthetic, the design. I mean, it goes back to the question about what is good design. You know, in Japan, it, it's extremely practical. You know, I would say that uh, things are very useful. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, maybe that's driven people from creating visual art to focusing on the industri the commercial industrial side of design and architecture. But the people still very much care about how people live in their spaces and how people use things. Um, I feel that in in the Americas, you know. Sure, you have great architecture and design, but you see more of that caring, you know, being bolstered by the public through the visual arts. Uh, so, you know, if there can be more uh, support uh, from the public going into 2020, I think that you have, uh, you know, not only a, uh, you know, a platform for the Olympics, but uh, in perpetuity. Every time I go to London, I immerse myself in the, the British Museum um, and just get lost there for, for a day. And after I walk out, I always think, I wish there were more hours in a day. Mm. And that, it always strikes me, I think this started off from a private collection. Yes. You know. um, is there an issue with, um, Japan's often l said to not have a philanthropic culture. Is there an issue where we've talked about you know, the role of private collectors, the role of the people sponsoring more or having great interests? Is there an issue with a lack of philanthropic culture in, in Japan? I don't think it's an, an individual issue. It's probably more of a corporate issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, globally, I think corporate social responsibility is an absolute must. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has to be a part of what you do. It's not about how much wealth you can accumulate or maximizing your profit. It really is about, uh, you know, maximizing uh, the contribution to your community. And uh, maybe uh, this is a whole nother conversation, kind of like how we touched on immigration, which we could talk about forever. Uh, but maybe uh, that is also part of a larger economic issue with Japan. Yes. Uh, I think in Japan, the, there is a, like a comic market, the, which is a really huge like opportunity to or event to attract people and i think there is some like a distribution system uh, it's uh, we can call it as an industry and also the cosplay is uh, very popular and uh, i think the certain amount of money is uh, coming through th those market uh, whereas as i s as you said that the contemporary art 
uh, in Japan, there is no distribution system like that. What is uh, the, the like a cause or the reason that uh, we don't have the like uh, the market for the contemporary art? Well, the market is a different thing from a, a distribution or a support system. But mm -hmm. you know, it goes back to Ross's original comment that you know these things came from private collections. So without the representation of a private collector making decisions with their own eye, it, it becomes very much, it's, it's a much slower process in my observation in Japan because they happen at a corporate level. So you have to go through very, a very bureaucratic system. Uh, you know, th that's, that's all I can, uh, it's a great mystery, but uh, I think that's, that's at the heart of it. Um, we're just about uh, uh, two minutes away from uh, Q&A. Um, I'd just like to uh, just recap with a couple of comments, very insightful comments that we've had from the panelists today. Um, I think one that I've men mentioned a, coup a couple of times is you know, Tokyo is a place that you have to find Tokyo. It won't find you. Um, and I think uh, you know, even as a long-term resident, I, I tend to agree with that. Uh, we talked about the fact that uh, you know, the 2020 Olympics should really be about opening up Tokyo to the world. Um, and not just selling Japan to the world or selling Tokyo to the world. And we talked about a lot of, uh, a lot about how Japan and the Tokyo should be seeking to open itself up. Um, we talked a lot about technology, um, the user-friendly applications, um, about and uh, uh, Nick mentioned roaming charges and and free Wi-Fi spots and all sorts of things like that. Um, and I think one of the great insightful comments that we had. Um, um, from Koji was that in Tokyo, all the ingredients are there. All the ingredients are there. It's a cultural magnet. Uh, it just needs leadership to turn that, that magnet into, uh, into a megaphone that's, that's going to go out there. Um, and I thought also um, Adrian's comment that it, London's experience was that the number of visitors to London actually went down during the Olympics. Um, by 5% because people that would normally came, come to London avoided London <laughs> during the time of the Olympics. And that comes into another comment about it's not just about the short-term accessibility. Uh, and I think there is a lot of focus on what do we need to do for all the tourists that are coming to the Olympics. It's not really about that. It's about the longer-term infrastructure that Tokyo can provide to... Um, bring people out, and um, Adrian mentioned that a, a part of that was um, the attraction of higher education and bringing people to Tokyo for an educational experience. Um, and we talked a lot about sort of opening up Tokyo uh, with the infrastructure like service departments, international schools. Um, Inokomo-san talked about the, uh, the Global 10 High School Initiative. Uh, we, uh, Koji mentioned the Arts Council Initiative. Um, and also uh, that um, that uh, it needed to come from the people, come from the people themselves. Uh, and one of the things that, we t that was mentioned was uh, in terms of particularly uh, art and creativity, it's about joining the dots between creativity and business, that the role of business can uh, provide. So I'd now like to turn over to um, the audience um, for any questions uh, that you might have. Uh, Nick's hand went up immediately. Uh, and we have about 20 minutes for, qu for questions. How long have I got? <laughs> I think it was 30 minutes, 30 seconds. I just, want to build I just want to build on what Adrian said. Maybe the numbers were down, but I just want to, I, I've lived in London all my life. I've got to tell you, London was an amazing place during the Olympics. We were astonished. There were large numbers of people, even if no visitor numbers were down. For me, as someone who's wrestled with the underground, the bus system, and so on, that legacy has remained as a, a, a fantastic place. Foreigners were able to get around. It was a place for fun. You knew where to go. You knew where to find people. You could bump into people. And it's that sense of making it a massive community rather than getting stifled by you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Just remember that, because then there'll be a legacy for Tokyo, which is people then do want to come here, not just for three weeks of sport, but actually as a place for fun and enjoyment and where they feel at home. Thank you very much. Uh, we were talking earlier about the fact that um, visitor satisfaction for people that come to Tokyo is 90%. 90% of people that visit Tokyo 
um, are satisfied. And I, I can't remember the data point, but I was once told that the number of tourists that repeat visit to Tokyo is one of the highest of any city in the world. Um, and so it really drives back that point that once you know Tokyo, you love Tokyo, but it's actually getting to know Tokyo that's the important thing. Um, but I think um, Nick's comment, massive community, that com building that community through the Olympics for that longer term infrastructure, it's great. Yes, sir. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, the, my question is about the safetyness in Tokyo, right? Uh, I dropped, I left uh, my cell phone three times in the past month, and then every time it's delivered back to me. <laughs> and then my friends dropped the cash in a, in a Ebisu street. And that, you know, bunch of uh, cash delivered back to her, okay? So uh, this is very safe city, right? And the, nobody mentioned about that. And uh, then uh, on the other hand, then uh, there is the opportunity and the possibility about the earthquake striking to the cities always, right? Okay, so uh, what do you think about that kind of a, you know, kind of a safetyness uh, feeling and the atmosphere in the understanding probably uh, for the older, you know, kind of a visitors and uh, whatever the cri creativity of the city? Or, you know, is there any idea? Thank you for the question. And I think many people will be following you home tonight. <laughs> um, safety and disaster prevention. Any comment? Uh, I think the, the Tokyo's best thing is uh, like uh, the, the air of Tokyo uh, makes you free. And the, the, that air consists of the, the like, uh, safety and the convenience and the, the, like, uh, um, the, the like, uh, amusement thing. And uh, uh, given the safety, you can go out uh, at night freely without uh, caring about uh, your like, safety. So, which is really important for the people's activities. That it uh, increases the level of activity. And earthquakes, uh, of course, uh, as a token, uh, as a city government, uh, we are doing uh, the as much as we could. So uh, the. We subsidized the, the, the buildings along the, the trunk road, uh, which will be the like uh, important way to the rescue. Mm -hmm. So the make the buildings uh, the seismic uh, tolerant. Yeah, so the many many things we are doing. Adrian has visited many cities in the world. Tokyo's safety record. Uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, I think I've had a few rumbles in my hotel room and places when I've uh, I've been around. Um, I I think safety is fantastic, um, but uh, I don't necessarily know what the correlation with creativity is. But I tend to think art flourishes in edgier <laughs> environments, <laughs> and uh, perhaps uh, you know Tokyo's niceness and its security is something that. Uh, we have to bear in mind, I'm not for one minute suggesting we make Tokyo less safe or a, or a nastier place, <laughs> but I, I definitely think that, um, that with a little bit more diversity, it might, it might have a little bit more edge. And if I think about some of the successes in London particularly, and sorry to refer back to it, but you know, some of the best things in London were created by foreigners. I mean, I've especially, oddly enough, one of the most iconic um, features of the modern British arts landscape, which is a theater built to perform Shakespeare and built in the style of an original Shakespearean theater, that's just the Globe Theater. And that was entirely the project of uh, an American, Sam Wanamaker, because British people felt that it was too dull. The idea of a Shakespearean theater, it was too old fashioned and sort of made a mockery of British modern British culture. And it took an American to come in and help us to reinvent our own past and celebrate it. And actually, when they did appoint um, the, the director, it was an Irishman <laughs> who was the first director of the, uh, of the theater, Mark Rylance, and he put on a fantastic uh, program. So uh, I think there's a lot to be gained culturally from allowing other people to mess with your culture. And, uh, and sometimes it takes other people to, to help you really understand what it is that you have to offer to build on the discussion of safety. I have a request for you, Inokuma-san and the city government. We finally managed to um, abolish 
the notorious uh, regulation about nightclubs. Mm -hmm. So now uh, we, we have legalized uh, operation of nightclubs in Tokyo. And uh, this is the untapped market, big untapped market, six hours mm -hmm. out of 24 hours. So we really need to develop a really exciting night nightlife industry mm -hmm. and night culture. And as uh, Adrian, you said uh, correctly, the, the more edgy places or more edgy environment uh, is the platform to develop new culture. So night culture is the key. I'm glad we uh, clarified the point about not wanting to make Tokyo any less safe. I thought, <laughs> I thought Adrian was going to propose a special economic zone for criminals beside the special economic zone for artists. <laughs> so I'm glad. I would only add that, I mean, in my mind, Japan is clean, orderly, and safe, yes? We're not going to realistically change that. I grew up in Los Angeles and New York my whole life, so not safe, not clean, not orderly, <laughs> the opposite. Great creative production, but you know, in a certain channel, uh, there is still great opportunity in Japan for other, especially preparing for the Olympics. You know, we can change. We can change that. It's, it's odd to say a positive into a positive. Uh, that you know, you use the clean, orderly, and safe aspects of Japan to attract families. Uh, you know, now, uh, you know, I do live in a clean, safe environment and I have two young children and I w it's a no-brainer to take them to Japan not to India or Brazil or you know parts of China uh, we will come to Japan twice a year easily that's great I think uh, also a tax point on those six hours at night and how effectively we use those um, as a PR guy, I thought, uh, you know, banning dancing in nightclubs and then saying, now you can dance was a great PR play. Uh, we got lots of coverage about it, but unfortunately it wasn't a PR thing. It was a real regulation that was actually killing that potential culture there. Uh, sorry, yes. Um, first, first of all, let me say I've been living here for a month. Uh, so polite and so safe. I, I love the people here. Having said that, I've lived in a lot of global cities, and if I'm going to describe what made Tokyo different. Tokyo, the, the thing that's common about the other countries is they're very much a melting pot. I don't get that sense from Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to understand what do you think is different about Tokyo that is maybe driving the reason why it's not becoming a melting pot. So that's what I'm curious about because I know apps will help, I know things will help, but maybe if we understand that, why it's not a melting pot, maybe we'll understand better how we can move forward. So thank you. Interesting question, why is Tokyo not a melting pot? Would anyone like to address that? Probably because we have uh, too few foreign people living here. Well, but that's the effect of that. I mean, uh, no, 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 it's, it's a cause as well. Okay. So that's why we are talking about um, the need to open up this, this city. And uh, also the in Japanese society, um, as we uh, experience the gro economic growth, rapid economic growth, uh, the Japanese society's system is re like a m m m not, not a diverse, the monocentric, mm, monocentric. Uh, monocentric system. So people uh, get the job at r around 20 years old and uh, continue in the one uh, company. And also the, the not the women's participation in the, the employment is high. Uh, the very low, uh, the women occupy only 8% in managerial level in the company. So uh, we try to promote the diverse work style and also the encourage the startups. The st I think the startups uh, could be more like a the you know innovative than the, the large company. So those things uh, all together uh, r make you feel that the Tokyo is not a melting pot. Yes. Yes. <laughs> May maybe we need a um, a tax incentive for innovative startups mm -hmm. to contribute more to contemporary art. <laughs> 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 yes. Sorry. Can we go? Just be. Um, thank you. Um, um, I'm a new uh, full-time student here at Globus, so I'm a, we're a uh, new immigrant, well, here, residents here in Japan. But um, I completely, uh, completely agree to the point that uh, trying to uh, 
not selling this time, but then opening up. But then at, uh, before that, I, I need to say that um, before we consider those, from my understanding for, for this whole month is that uh, there, there is a gap because people do recognize it. It, it is recognized by practically the whole world, the, the, the characteristics of Japan, uh, the food, the, the, the culture, the architect, and even the language. People are willing to come and, and learn. But as a, as a new resident here, I'm having difficulty just to be in Japan. Like, even getting a resident card doesn't mean anything. It's very difficult for people to live here to start off with. So I think before attacking the problem of um, uh, bringing expertise and professionals in, there might be a priority, priority to, do, um, to, to work on this stuff. That's my personal. Can you be a little bit more specific? What For example, what if you have a residence card, you it's it's still impo almost impossible to uh, to rent a place because you need a phone. You, you need a phone because you need bank account, and you can't get a bank account because you need six. You need to be here six months, and without the prior address, you can't get a bank account. Everything's tied together. There's nothing that you start off with, uh, basically. It sounds like Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Would anyone like to make a comment? I wasn't quite sure the point you were making in the beginning, well, but, the when point you is but when you, under when you well, were the specific, the I understand. Sorry, the, the yeah. point is, before having um, the mentality saying, oh, we need to bring more expertise in, the point is, shouldn't, we open, shouldn't Japan open up for, like, for people easier to come in and, and, yeah. and live? So then it's, it's not just a visitor and a tourist thing. Our one effort is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the established the one-stop business establishment center. However, and, and uh, through those jobs, uh, we understand that sometimes uh, the the people cannot open the account, although they have to have an account to like uh, apply the something. And uh, I think um, uh, I I don't have exact answer to that, but uh, we are aware of and uh, we will improve, I think. Can I just say, I mean, I had three colleagues who did actually make the trip to, uh, to, to Japan, to Tokyo, and they were all stopped at Tokyo Immigration because the customs officers weren't aware that the countries in which they lived were part of the European Union and therefore they didn't need visas. They had to actually go onto a website to demonstrate uh, to the customs officers that uh, these countries were in fact in the EU Schengen zone. So uh, I, I think possibly even right at the front door, there could be a little bit uh, done to make uh, access to this country a little smoother, perhaps. But I'm sure we all have our complaints against immigration officers, but certainly it's the toughest. Uh, I travel to a lot of places, and it's one of the toughest places to get into. Interesting. Nancy. Yeah, I just want to follow up from what Adrian was mentioning earlier, why is Tokyo not a place that students from around the world really want to come to? I think there's, uh, I've guest lectured at a lot of universities and been affiliated with several here, and I'm just stopped in my tracks at the lack of intellectual stimulation and debate. Even trying to have discussion in the classroom doesn't take place because of the way, of course, I'm lecturing in English, but the way that English is taught here, it's written form, so I have to put questions on the board. So London, New York, you go and you almost major in those cities, but you're not majoring in Tokyo, and that's going to be a real problem for beyond 2020. So can you all address that again? I, it's, a, it's a difficult issue, I think, for us to address in the concept of Tokyo, because education is a national function. Um, but uh, higher, education? higher education. Yeah. Okay, higher ed. Yeah. But uh, the recently, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government owns the university, and uh, in that university, some classes are conducted in English. But the what you mentioned is not uh, regardless the language, mm -hmm. but the, the like uh, intellectual mm -hmm. stimulus. I think it's uh, the the problem of diversity for the first step. Mm. Well, I, I taught at Globis University, and the situation is very different. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have the right setting, 
and the right group of people, actually Japanese people can, can be very active in classrooms as well. But I fully agree that we need more diversity because if we have more foreign people, and then the discussion level and participation level will be probably much higher. And I think if you look at what the opportunity of 2020 presents, it's uh, the opportunity to set some ambitious goals. And if you look at what PM Abe has done in terms of goals regarding women's integration into leadership, 30% by 2020 is what he's, uh, what he's asked for. I think you can see that using 2020 as a sort of cultural uh, milestone and setting some really, really ambitious goals, even if you don't necessarily meet them, in terms of cultural diversity, in terms of, uh, of bringing people in, I think those would be really important things. And I think to the point about Tokyo, it may well be some of these issues are national issues, but these games will be judged as Japan's games, not as Tokyo's games. Uh, we have time for one or two last questions. Yes, back there. Thank you, John Ashburn here. Um, everyone will recall that uh, Japan has hosted the Olympics once before. And there's a famous anecdote where the street signs around Tokyo were um, produced bilingually. They're in Japanese, uh, on Ginza, Japanese and English. And then, once the games had finished, those signs were all dutifully taken down. That's the story. And um, I'm wondering what is being put into place to make sure that this legacy uh, is maintained after 2020, and in particular with um, relationship to creativity. So what, what practical measures are being taken to preserve a creative legacy? Anyone like to tackle that? Well, first of all, um, yeah, I don't think we are so stupid to do the same <laughs> <laughs> this time. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for raising that question. And um, I, I know that the, the governor, Masuzoe, is uh, really persistent about, um, well, ma is really making sure that uh, all the efforts we are making right now uh, will be uh, producing some a positive effect beyond 2020. And my next, 20, uh, next Tokyo team has uh, the same aspiration as well. So uh, many people here are working on individual efforts with the view that uh, it's going to be um, something that produces the future for the country and for the world beyond 2020. That's, that's the key. But um, probably this time uh, we'll be better in doing that. We are very aware of that the, the Olympic is not just for sport, but for the culture. And so we have uh, issued the cultural vision, and we are going to produce a lot of, like a variety of a different type of culture in Tokyo. Okay, we have about uh, 40 seconds left. I'd just like to go through panelists, maybe 20 seconds, uh, sorry, 10 seconds each. <laughs> One last comment. <laughs> Two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, you know there's a lot of stake, obviously, for uh, 2020. But sure, sorry. But uh, this really is about a new chapter in the cultural legacy of, of Japan, and so uh, you know there's such larger issues at stake, economic and uh, and you know immigration and, and otherwise. But uh, you know we have to start somewhere. So uh, I think. Uh, the creative arts in particular have always been a bellwether for many things to come, uh, and so we cannot uh, underestimate how important this initiative is. I think we'll be able to become the world's most exciting creative city um, if uh, we have a support from all of you, so stay tuned. I think set some ambitious goals in terms of cultural infrastructure, not just physical and sporting infrastructure. And I think if you do that, um, it'll be a fantastic city to come back to in 10 years' time. I think the fundamental like, feature of Tokyo is uh, the it has the power to progress constantly uh, to for the better future. 
and absorbing the and uh, digesting the different things and uh, create a new one. And uh, we are now aiming at a m mature city with a uh, higher standard, with m more diversity and creativity. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. And please thank my panelists today. <laughs> <laughs>